Last predictions question. It's going to be a tough one. Matthew, when I have you on in, in six months, and we're sitting here doing this again, talking about all these different components, financial markets, the economy, what does it look like? What, what are we experiencing? Um, I love Dr. Peter Lindemann, who's also economist, Wharton School of Real Estate, but also uh, of Lindemann Associates, always has his canary. Um, what is the canary um, or what, what's, what's the outlook six months from now? Just give us your, your crystal ball here and definitely not holding you to anything, but just from the data that you're interpreting right now. Yeah, you know, I made jokes with people. It's much, it's much easier, not easier, but you know, it's hard enough to figure out like what has just happened, <laughs> much less <laughs> what's going on now, much less what's going to happen in six months. So, Welcome to Invest for the Win, where we discuss strategies to win at the game of private investing. Whether you're a novice or a seasoned investor, tune in to hear experts break down complex topics and reveal emerging trends in private investing. Head over to investforthewin.com to find links to these episodes and additional content. Position yourself to invest for the win. Hosted by the founders of FTW Investments, Logan Freeman, Corey Tuck, and Parker Webb. On today's episode, we have Matthew Klein. Matthew is a financial and economic um, reporter and uh, journalist. He's written a book that is uh, widely held as a, a top book in this uh, in this sector. We talk about so much today in regards to finance, the economy, Federal Reserve, uh, so many different important concepts to understand. We break down GDP. We talk about productivity, what the Fed should do. And uh, you can definitely check out Matthew's work at The Overshoot, but uh, phenomenal conversation. I felt like we could have gone for hours and hours today. I do think you're going to get some good insights. It's a nice, timely conversation. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Invest for the Win podcast. On today's show, we have Matthew Klein of Overshoot and is the founder and publisher of The Overshoot, a premium subscription research service focused on the global economy, financial markets, and public policy. Matthew's also the co-author of Trade Wars or Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. That book won the 2021 Lionel Gelbler Prize and is listed as one of the best books of the year by Financial Times. It's pretty cool, man. His work is read around the world by central bankers, other top academics, government officials, and a wide range of investors and asset managers. Before launching the overshoot, Matthew was the economist commentator at Barron's. Now I remember where I found out about Matthew. It was uh, from Barron's, actually. Um, so that's where it was. We were just talking offline about that. Matthew wrote previously for the Financial Times, Bloomberg View, and The Economist. Matthew lives in San Francisco with his wife, daughter, and cat. Matthew, I provided just a brief overview of who you are and a bit of your work experience, but I want you to hear how you found yourself in this line of work, researching and breaking down the economy and financial systems, which is not an easy thing to do. First of all, thank you, Logan, very much for the kind introduction and for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, it's a great question. How did I end up in this? I mean, I, what, quite frankly, I did not know this even was a career path, you know, when I was getting started. I was, you know, I remember being in college and, you know, I was a history major and I figured at the time, well, you know, this was before the financial crisis and, and the rough sense I had was, you know, it was pretty easy to, you didn't have to worry necessarily what you were studying in college. There were plenty of jobs available sooner or later and wherever you end up, they'll teach you what you need to know. And, and that was, you know, not, not true shortly thereafter, but, uh, you know, in the world of 2006, 2007, that seemed like how the world worked. Uh, and I was very fortunate that I was looking at um, various job opportunities and I happened to be able to get an internship with Bridgewater Associates, which says, you know, global macro. And I was very fortunate in the sense that, you know, they took the attitude that everything they already knew was so much more than anything anyone could have learned in college that it didn't matter that I hadn't studied this stuff going in. They just cared if someone they thought could, you know, learn the material. And, you know, I start there in the summer of 2008 as an intern. It was a fascinating time to be you know, getting introduction to global markets and the economy, how all this stuff works. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah. Just a really interesting set of puzzles. And like, I mean, for the first several weeks, I had no idea what was going on. It was actually very stressful and challenging. But, it, you know, it starts to kind of seep in. I thought this is a really interesting stuff to, to figure out. It's really satisfying intellectually. And when the financial crisis happens, it wasn't even just that. It was also, this is really important things. And a lot of people don't know it. And, you know, quite frankly, if people make mistakes about this stuff, it can ruin a lot of people's lives. And so that was sort of the beginning of when I decided I want to be in a more of a sort of a public facing, you know, interacting with the world role. I mean, it's obviously very good for people to be focused on the stuff internally, but 
I realized that, you know, for better or worse, like I wanted to make it so that the broader, you know, a broader engagement with the public and hoping to influence policy. And, and it was a bit of a circuitous path to get in there. And it took a few twists and turns, but ultimately uh, was able to get into, you know, financial journalism and writing about these things and, you know, being able to sort of marry the, the skills that I developed earlier on um, with, you know, data and having a sense of how the economy fits together with, you know, writing skills and so forth and, and, you know, ended up here. That's uh, an incredible journey. And um, I, you, you, you did say Bridgewater Associates, right? That's right. All right. Phenomenal, because one of my questions uh, in today's episode is going to be all about that. So I'm excited about that. Love Ray Dalio in the work that he does and uh, have read a lot of his books, especially his most recent book, which I'm sure uh, we'll talk about here soon. So you wrote a book. OK, so you were, um, you know, in the business and then decided to, to write a book. So trade wars are class wars. How rising inequality distorts the global economy and threatens international peace. What was the driving force that made you want to write that book? So I did not know at this point in time that I, I was capable of writing a book. I was I was fortunate. So this was a co-author book. I wrote it with Michael Pettis, and I you know I've been following his work for a long time. I was introduced to it basically right out of college at at Bridgewater. They're big fans of him, and you know over the years I'd been reading his stuff, and he I was fortunate that he read things that I'd written at the Economist and the FT, and you know we developed a correspondence, and. I realized that, you know, we had a very similar way of thinking about how, you know, the global economy fits together and how the pieces fit together. And, and you know, we had sort of complementary um, skill sets for that would be that would be good for cooperating. And he actually pitched the idea of the book to me, uh, I guess, at the end of 2017. And, you know, that that was a period where obviously there's a lot of discussion about trade conflict and economic conflict. And, and the view that we had was, look, all this stuff is basically wrong, even, you know. All the sides of the debate, whether you're in favor of it or not, like they're using the wrong kind of analytical framework. And we thought there was really an opportunity for kind of breaking things down on a very basic level, grounding it in history and in data and kind of making a story out of it. And then explaining how these things actually work and how you should be thinking about, about trade and economic conflict. And then, you know, we wrote the book in the course of 2018, 2019, and um, very gratifying to see that it was uh, very well received, even if it came out <laughs> right in the middle of the pandemic, which was right. obviously not something, not something we'd been anticipating, but, you know, that's, can't control things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you think a few of the top takeaways that listeners can garner from the book if they're not going to go read? I, I love to read, so I will dive in and I have di- dove in, uh, but I'm, I'm curious, what are some of the top takeaways just from your perspective? Sure. So I think probably the biggest one is that prosperity is not a scarce resource and the world should not be understood as this zero sum competition between countries where some people are going to inherently only do better if other people do worse. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very common misconception across a whole bunch of, you know, the political spectrum. And that's not, that's not right. That, that for example, we I say very explicitly, the reason why U.S. workers or a lot of U.S. workers were harmed by Chinese policies, certain policy from the Chinese government was not because the Chinese government was doing things that benefited Chinese workers and Chinese consumers. It was actually that the Chinese government for its own internal reasons was doing things that were bad for many Chinese people. And that as a side effect of this also ended up harming a lot of Americans. And that the beneficiaries were not just, you know, certain elites in China, but also certain elites in the United States. And so thinking about it from the perspective of the US versus China is just fundamentally the wrong way of looking at this. Um, the good news is that there are things that can be done that are beneficial for either everyone or at least the vast majority of the population. That's really the key takeaway of the book. Yeah, yeah. One one of the things that I pulled out of the book, and you could tell me if this is incorrect, but it seemed like the, some of the main points is that you know countries with large economic inequalities suffer from two related potential economic problems. One, underconsumptionist tendencies due to the inability of impoverished workers to buy all the output produced, and speculative excesses due to the accumulation of large pools of financial capital by high-income individual and individuals and businesses. And I thought that that was a, a decent way to kind of think about, um, you know, setting the stage for uh, for the book. And it also emphasized the special advantages enjoyed in burdens faced by the United States, which is very interesting to me due to the dollar's role as the world's reserve currency and the United States financial sector role as a safe haven, so to speak. And so one of the things that I, I, I've also read recently was uh, Paul Volcker's um, memoir, which I found very interesting to read, especially during uh, these times. And the reason I read that book was I saw him and Ray Dalio sit down for a, a conversation that they recorded and and he put out. And I, I thought, man, I'd, I'd really like to, if Ray Dalio is saying this guy is his 
uh, one of his mentors and one of his um, heroes in life. I should probably uh, know a little bit more about him. And um, it was fascinating uh, to kind of hear uh, the way that the Federal Reserve's uh, focus was then and, and maybe what it is now. And so I'm sure we'll touch on that today as well. So thank you uh, for one, taking the undertaking of, of writing a book and trying to you know, bring that to, to light. I think that's fantastic. And we've, we've talked a little bit about Ray Dalio. And I'm a big I'm a big Ray Dalio reader. In his most recent work, The Changing World Order, you know, Ray studied the rise and fall of all major dynasties and world powers and found that there's a big cycle that they follow. And for me, not being, a, you know, studying economics or anything in college, I love graphics and, and being able to understand things like that. And so the big cycle focuses on three main components, big debt and debt monetization, internal conflicts over wealth and value gaps, and external conflicts. Most importantly, the rise of a great power to challenge the existing great power. And he describes that as China in his in his book. So, you know, he, and then he, he recently has taken up writing on LinkedIn, which I uh, very much enjoy and appreciate. Uh, but he says kind of he finds the United States in this current paradigm the, that the United States is spending a lot more money than it's earning and printing and taxing a lot. Secondly, that we have large wealth, value and political gaps that are leading to significant internal conflict, and lastly, the potential being in, in decline relative to a, an emerging great power, and that's China. I wanted to ask you if you've read this book, Matthew, and um, if you um, agree with the sentiment, or what would your be your, your take on those prior comments? So I haven't read the whole book, but I do remember that as various chapters are being written, they got released on LinkedIn, and I have read a few of them. So this might not be a fully uh, you know, comprehensive response. And if, if it's not the case, then you know, I'm sorry. But my, my general impression from what I had read is I think the model itself is, I think, plausible. I'm, my question is, I'm not sure necessarily how I would characterize the U.S. and China in the way that, that he did in terms of, in terms of this model. I'm, I'm, I, I would sort of put, you know, I think you can very plausibly put them either at similar positions or even potentially inverted ones, given, you know, depending on what specific factors you're looking at. Um, but that, that's sort of my, my, I mean, we can go into more details of why I might think that if, if you want, but. Um, yeah, he talked about, yeah. he's, he's, he's drafted um, kind of this model of uh, the country power index, right? So he's right. looking at all these different countries and have different indexes based on certain things that are happening um, in the, you know, in those economies. Well, some of that is data driven, I would say, but it, I think some people look at that and when he released uh, the power index, it was um, somewhat subjective to his own his own uh, interpretation of that as well. And so, um, but it was really interesting to take a crack at that. And that is a huge uh, undertaking that he did. And I, I found it to be extremely helpful in just understanding the history. I loved reading about yeah. um, all of the different rises and, and, and declines of, of uh, different powers. But one of the biggest things I think in that book that kind of illuminate was illuminated for me was the world reserve currency. So could you just talk about how important that is um, and the you know implications? Because I have a lot of, of inputs coming into me that I, I read. I love to get everybody's different perspectives. Some folks think that we're in, in dire, you know, you know, straits of losing the world reserve currency now that the dollar is at the strongest point it's ever been. Love to hear your perspective just on world reserve currency where the dollar is. Sure. So this is a subject that we do cover in the book, uh, in our book, Trade Wars, or Class Wars. And I think a lot of the conversation about reserve currency can sometimes get a little confused in the sense that a lot of people, I think, make two potential mistakes. One is they assume that it's always a good thing when it's not necessarily a good thing. And the other thing is that they assume that it's fundamentally driven by the choices of the whoever issues this currency when that's only sometimes the case. I think a much better model for thinking about this is that it's what do other people in the rest of the world want to do and how do those choices affect the people who use this international currency as their, their regular domestic currency? You know, we use dollars, we live in the United States, the dollar financial system is ostensibly for us. But for whatever reason, there's a very, very large role played by people in the rest of the world in the dollar financial system. And that sometimes can have very negative consequences for Americans. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's beneficial, but sometimes it's, it's harmful. And so assessing whether this is a good thing or not, I think is, is challenging. The other thing I'd make a, a point of as well, and this is, is that you can have multiple reserve currencies at the same time. The idea there's only one at any point in time is not actually historically accurate. One thing I remember being surprised about when doing the research for trade wars or class wars is that in the 19th century, when you have this period, people think about sterling as, as the reserve currency. Is that, that's not, I mean, sterling was, you know, the British, British currency was probably the single most dominant one, but actually the US dollar was used outside the US. 
Um, German marks were used outside of Germany. French francs were used outside. I think even a little bit you see sometimes, um, you know, Russian rubles. And so, you know, how that worked. And of course, the most common thing was actually gold, which wasn't issued by anybody. Um, and so, you know, thinking about like, what is the reserve currency and how that benefits, um, you know, it, it can be it can be challenging because after all, if, if, if one of the things that you do as a policymaker is think this reserve currency is important, I have to defend the currency for the benefit of these people outside the country, that might lead you to take pursue policies that will be harmful to people in your own country and making the, the, your currency stronger, more expensive than it should be, which basically means that on the one hand, imports are cheaper, which if you need imports is valuable, but it also means that your exports are going to be much less competitive. And that risks the possibility of essentially forcing a lot of your manufacturers out of business. Yeah. So what happened in, in the UK after the end of World War One, for example, is they wanted to maintain the, the status and preeminence of sterling throughout the British Empire. And they had good political reasons for doing this. Basically, a lot of savers in places like Canada and South Africa and India had effectively lent to the British government during World War One, and they and the people in you know the, in the British establishment felt that those those savers should be rewarded and, and their savings be you know returned. But the flip side is that in doing so, their economy was so weak after the end of World War One. The only way they could do that was by keeping the currency, the pound, artificially expensive, and it ended up destroying the British economy. I mean, the 20s in the UK were actually much more painful than the 1930s, which is the inverse of what you saw in basically every other country. And that's a function of sort of misunderstanding what reserve currency can mean. So think about the context of the US. I think a lot of what's happened in the past several decades is that foreigners like the dollar for a lot of reasons, one of which is the openness and ease with which it, you can put money in the United States and the credibility of the legal regime, the fact that it's all in English, which is sort of the universal language of, of, of finance and you know the rich or whatever. And, and all those things mean that more money comes into the US to buy financial assets than necessarily can be supported. And so sometimes, you know, the, the most benign outcome here is that we just you know, you, you build like billionaires row type situations in Manhattan and then people buy empty apartments and that's kind of dumb, but at least like, you know, no one's getting put out of work. The worst outcome is what happened, you know, in the 2000s where you have this enormous creation of mortgage debt by lending to people who shouldn't have been borrowing or shouldn't have been borrowing that much. Um, temporarily, they're better off, but then, you know, that's not sustainable and they end up going bankrupt, they lose their house and then the whole economy, you know, collapses. And that's obviously bad for everyone. So, you know, people say like the reserve currency is good or it's bad. I mean, I think it's really important to have this kind of context here and, you know, being aware what are the drivers. Mm -hmm. In the context of China, I'm just going to briefly add that I'm, I am not convinced that Chinese government policymakers actually want to do the things that would make it possible for the yuan to be a reserve currency. And I think they have good reasons, quite frankly, but it's not easy to put money into China necessarily. There are a lot of, it's become easier in the past few years, but it's not easy. It's also not necessarily easy to get the money out when you want to, which is a crucial point. You know, property rights are not necessarily secure. There are a lot of rules and limitations there. And I think, quite frankly, if we were to look at places that might become, not, you know, rivals to the dollar, but more, you know, comparable to the dollar in terms of international usage, I would think potentially there's more scope um, in the euro. Although even there, there are a lot of issues that sort of prevent it in terms of the way we've seen them managing their sovereign debt crises and so forth. But I think there's, you know, we, if we have this kind of perspective on what makes a currency reserve currency, you know, for better or worse, I do not see the dollar's position really endangered one way or another. Wow. I really appreciate you breaking that down and giving your perspective there. Very enlightening. So thank you for that. Um, you've written extensively since I've been following you for the last 12 months on inflation and what the Fed should do, understanding COVID inflation, Putin inflation, and other hot topics. Can you somehow give us a summary on the last 12 months, maybe it's longer, of what you've witnessed and some of your writings? Because um, I think it's very interesting, and uh, I really like your perspective on a lot of that. So somehow, uh, maybe just starting with the pandemic, because that's a good, I think, um, starting place for us. Kind of break down the last you know, two and a half, two and a half years or so of what's been going on. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom out even further a little bit and say that we you know what what is inflation? Inflation is there's too much spending relative to how much stuff is available. And you know that sounds very simple, and I'm very confident that is the correct definition. The problem is 
both sides of that equation are very you know complicated in the NDP chain. Like how much stuff is available, you know, there's all sorts of different things people want. How much you know the extent that businesses can make more things when people want more is is not evenly distributed across the economy. Spending is not just how much money is in the bank or how much money people are paid, but also their access to credit and how much they can monetize, you know, home equity wealth or whatever. So it's complicated, but that's basically how I would think about it. What happened with the pandemic, I think, is very clearly that the amount of stuff that we were able to produce went down. And there's lots of things we can point to. At the same time, the mix of things that people wanted to buy changed very quickly. And mm -hmm. some of the things we wanted to buy, businesses were not prepared to produce enough to compensate. That was partly offset by other things people not wanting to buy. And so you can look, for example, at like the CPI of all these different price components, the consumer price index, different components. And in the first period of the pandemic, so, you know, from January, basically in 2020, yeah. the price of laundry equipment, you know, washer dryers or whatever, it went up, I think, 20% in 2020. Airline fares went down 25%. And I mean, this is very obvious why this happened, right? And so the weird thing is that in 2020, basically in the first full 12 months of pandemic, so up through February of 2021, those kinds of things basically canceled out. And the inflation rate was exactly basically what it was before the pandemic, which is actually a very weird coincidence. And I don't think we should you know, read too much into that as being like a real thing. Of, oh, we solved inflation. And it's also not as if we were better off. I mean, consumer spending as a whole was way down. So basically people spent a lot less money and they got a lot less stuff, but prices rose by the same amount. The other thing that happened is that the government did, I think, basically the right thing, which is that if you have a situation where a lot of people just can't buy things and can't work the way they're used to, you know, they still have bills to pay. And so you don't want to have a situation where, you know, someone doesn't go out to a, you know, sit down restaurant or get on a plane and then have that be a situation where, you know, the person who works the airline, you know, defaults in their mortgage or gets evicted or like has to cut back on their spending on something that other like otherwise is still working. That would just magnify and amplify the impact the economic impact of the pandemic far beyond the initial damage. And so the government did basically the right thing. We can talk you know, like the particulars, maybe you know, whatever, but like the basic idea is like give people enough money so that doesn't happen. And that worked. And you can see what happened is basically in the first year of the pandemic, you had this huge increase in incomes, household incomes that was not at all matched by spending. Spending went down. And so basically people just saved it. So some people, you know, they kept spending as they should. Some people just, you know, weren't able to do things. They just didn't do vacations or whatever. And there they saved more. But the net effect was, um, you know, basically good. There weren't, you know, massive defaults or anything. There weren't, you know, people had more money overall. People, you actually saw a nice decline in, you know, credit card debt. People paid off obligations that were high interest. And so generally you had a situation where, um, you know, poverty rate fell. A lot of good things ended up happening as a consequence of this response. It would have been much better. It was much better than I think any of the alternatives. Then you have, you get to the spring of 2021 and you have well, essentially like the beginning of the reopening. People are starting to get vaccinated. Things are, you know, returning to normalcy. There's also more money going out the door because, you know, quite frankly, at that point in time, it wasn't necessarily clear, you know, we, whether we were out of the woods, like vaccine rollout was proceeding more slowly. There was figured in sort of, a, you know, a lot of the money that had been dispersed back in April of 2020, you know, that had run out. So there was more money that was sent in the system and you have, you know, reopening. And then what happens is prices start to, to rise more. And so there's two things happening. One thing that's a very good thing is that consumer spending basically goes back up in you know in inflation adjusted terms, in real terms, back to sort of where you would have thought it would have been had there been no pandemic starting around March 2021. But prices start rising faster. And there's a kind of couple categories here where they're really driving some of these things. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you have in the beginning of the pandemic, you have a couple very significant decisions that ended up you know, really hurting us more recently. One is that um, auto manufacturers basically just shut down production. Yep. You can look at like how many uh, cars and trucks were assembled in the United States in April, and it was essentially zero. And uh, the, um, you know, th that shortfall was never closed. In fact, they kept producing less. They basically had the view, not necessarily unreasonably, that the recovery was not going to be robust. They were worried about a, sort of what happened after 2008. And so you ended up, even before the chip shortage becoming became an issue, um, a sh shortfall of several million vehicles, and you know obviously you know if, if people buy you know on average like 17 million new cars and trucks a year, and you're you know now we're at the point of there's like 4.1 million that are missing. I mean that's going to have an effect somewhere along the line. It had an effect on rental car prices, on used car prices, new car prices, parts, all that stuff. The other big thing that happened, or another big thing that happened, is you have um you know the oil drillers in the U.S all get wiped out in bankruptcy. You know, the oil, you remember West Texas Intermediate price went negative briefly um, and they just shut down. And, 
you know, it's while it is conceptually easy to start spinning that stuff up again, shale is unlike other kinds of drilling. It takes, you know, many years before the oil flows, shale is pretty quick to, to restart. The problem is that, you know, this was the second bankruptcy in a few years, right? The previous time was in 2015, 2016. And so all the classes of investors who'd come in were like, we're not going to do this again. Let's take it very slowly. And, um, you know, so they've basically been very reticent to enable much production growth. And you have other things related to this. So like a bunch of refineries that in, you know, February and March, 2020, maybe, you know, the owners were thinking, well, these are getting old. Either we pay a bunch now for maintenance when it's not obvious the demand is going to be there, or we just mothball them. And they basically decided to go for option two. And so now the result is that refining capacity in the US, and not just the US, by the way, but like the US is where you get the weekly data. So it's easiest to look at this stuff. It's down, you know, quite a bit. And so even though total demand for this stuff, you know, for gasoline, diesel and stuff is not higher than it was before, um, because there's less ability to produce it, that means to higher prices. You know, there are other categories we can point to as well. But I mean, a lot of these kinds of things are just, you have a recovery on the one hand, that's better than what a lot of people were expecting. Not so good, but you know, better than enough than people cut supply. You have a shift, an enduring shift in terms of what people are trying to get. And you have to a certain extent, you have this more um, you know, money and credit available. Although that's I, I wouldn't overstate the importance of that. Uh, and then of course, more recently you have you know other things with, you know, for example, when, when Russia invades Ukraine, there's all sorts of commodities that become affecting their supply, whether you know, oil and natural gas are obvious ones, but there's also wheat, there's sunflower oil, which is a big cooking oil in Europe, there's neon, which is used as an input for making microprocessors. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, trying to add up all this stuff, like what is inflation? It's basically, you know, there, there, it's mostly a mix, not entirely, but it's mostly a mix of fewer things available, goods and services available relative to sort of what a normal you know, expectation would have been. And that's showing up in, in the pressure of higher prices. It's not all that, but that's sort of the preponderance of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think so many folks try to like pull one of those things out and say, hey, this is what's impacting the economy. And you just, you know, detailed uh, 50 different things that uh, all kind of happened at once. And that's not even the, the, the scratch surface of the scope of, of what was going on. So it's a very unique scenario that we kind of find ourselves in. Um, so my next question is around your method, because I am just a, a new, um, you know, uh, learner of economics and, and understanding all these different pieces. But I'd love to understand if you have a method for understanding the economy and financial markets and deriving actionable insights from those findings. Like, I'm big with um, mental models, so I try to find uh, mental models that I can understand and use on a regular best in, you know, basis in regards to investing. But I'm curious if you have a mental model that's been developed over the years and how one goes about deciphering the noise out there and figure out what they should actually be tracking or keeping their eye on. Do you have um, something that you do on a regular basis? Or uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think the, I guess at the most basic level, you know, I have this belief, which has been drilled into me that everything has to add up in a particular, you know, in a way like the economy as a whole is a system and everything affects everything else. And so if you see something in one part of the world or one part of the country or whatever, it has to, there has to be some kind of offsetting way it balances out somewhere else. And so that's a very helpful way for thinking through. If you look at, you know, a certain individual data point, putting that in context, you know, for example, like if the household savings rate goes up in the U.S., you know, there's only so many other way, like ways that that can happen in terms of what the sort of offsetting forces are. And so it's very helpful to kind of have this framework of how everything adds up. And I think that's probably at the, at the most basic level, I think it comes from, you know, this. And then the other thing is really knowing, you know, having an understanding and investing the time and knowing like, what are the data? How are they collected? What are, you know, what are the definitions that the people who are actually producing these numbers you know, using here, like how to, you know, and thinking about that and, you know, knowing how to interpret things that way. And that's really just, I mean, the math is actually pretty simple. It's mostly, you know, addition, subtraction, maybe a little multiplication division, but I mean, it's not, you know, it's mostly kind of conceptually like, okay, how do these things all fit together and how should we think about that? And that's, that's really kind of the method. Yeah. I remember seeing one of your newsletters saying that uh, one of those markers wasn't adding up and something is uh, not working out here. So um, I think that's a really helpful way to think about this. And you know, I'm, I'm in a lot of different groups and we have different economists come and speak. One is really focused on manufacturing and, and business perspectives, it's ITR economics. It's Chris and Alan, Alan Bolio. And uh, they, they came and gave a presentation, which I thought was pretty enlightening. They went over a lot of data and, and um, made some predictions and, and things like that, which was helpful. But um, they were trying to figure out how to advise and, and as, you know, business owners on, on how to successfully navigate um, today's marketplace. And, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the uh, results of that was a little bit mixed because, you know, they have a, a big, they have a big model that uh, says in 2030, we're going to have a, a great depression, right? So not uh, just a normal 
business cycle, but a, a really sizable depression in regards to uh, the economy. And they have some different things that they, they talk about, demographics being one of them, um, you know, the Fed's debt and all these different things, or the government's debt, sorry, uh, and all these different pieces. But uh, I'm curious, do you get into, or how do you think about as a business owner um, right now, thinking about, you know, inflation, uh, interest rates, and um, un low unemployment, uh, and, and trying to navigate what's going on in, in today's marketplace. Um, do you ever have those conversations with, with business owners on, on what they're uh, asking you, these types of questions? So generally, to be honest, no. I mean, most of the conversations I have with people are, you know, other you know, financial market participants, so their perspective is a little different on these things. But, you know, I will say that <clears throat> there's so much variety in what people are experiencing right now that I don't think it necessarily would be helpful to look at, you know, what is the national labor market showing on average or what is the national inflation on average for you know an, an individual business you know your own cost structure your you know ability to find workers and pay them or what have you and like your demand are all going to be i think probably very you know especially now i think there's so much variety and and, and variance um, now compared to what you know the average company is doing that is probably more helpful to be looking at those kind of specific factors um as, as what i would say i mean like unless you're sort of in things like housing market where like that i can you know we can sort of seriously clearly like clearly see like what's going on there with mortgage rates otherwise you know there's so many different moving parts and you know the very you know there's a lot of different forces that different businesses are being hit by and so i would be cautious of using macro data to provide too much you know specific recommendations yeah, absolutely. It's it's super local in regards to your, and it's niched, in my opinion, in regards to what, what business you're in. I mean, the way that uh, my buddy who owns Blue Springs Ford is navigating uh, today's economy is a lot different than a uh, commercial real estate investor is. So um, there's a lot of different moving parts to that. So I, I definitely agree. You know, one of the things that we're, we're tracking a lot, and I love reading uh, uh, De Dr. Uh, Edward Yardini's research, and, and he, he does a good job, I think, on a weekly basis, daily basis, um, putting some good data out there and, and trying to understand, you know, what what is a recession and are we in one and are we headed for one? Is the Fed going to uh, be able to achieve a soft landing and all of these things? These are the headlines that we hear, right? Um, so curious to get your perspective on what is the what is a recession? Um, and so many different people um, look at nominal GDP, real GDP. What is a recession? Are we in one? We don't know until we are. I just love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm pretty confident we're not in one right now. Um, but, you know, what is the definition? I mean, the definition of a recession is you have a situation where economic activity, broadly speaking, so like business production, incomes, employment, all stuff has peaked and then goes down for a while. And then at some point it bottoms and then you have recovery after that. That's, that's essentially what it is. And so we have a lot of numbers available. You know, the GDP numbers come out once a quarter. The inputs of GDP, most of those things come out once a month or even more frequently. So we can look like, you know, the government, the census will say like, okay, here's like the monthly trade balance or here's like the inventory situation this month or here's what home building is this month or here's what manufacturing production is this month or you know, here's what the job, you know, how many jobs are added this month, things like that. So you actually have a pretty good sense before the quarterly number comes out of, you know, broadly speaking, you know, are things going up or down? Sometimes you get things revised. So that's like one thing to bear in mind, but given how much, um, employment is growing given how, uh, you know, and, and wages are, are still growing. I mean, wage growth is slowing, but I mean, this is not, you know, at the moment consistent with, put it this way, it hasn't happened yet. It might be, it might very well happen. I mean, this is sort of where it gets your question about sort of soft landing and, and what the Fed's doing. So the Fed is basically of the view, I think, I sympathize where they're coming from, but I think they're potentially a little wrong here, which is that they're saying, look, the reason we have inflation is essentially there's too much spending. And or even if that's not the reason, the, we are obligated to stop inflation and the way we will stop inflation is by reducing spending or making sure the private sector cuts back on spending, whether or not that's you know the optimal. It seems to be the approach they're taking. And that approach could be very costly. I mean, not yet. Um, I mean, we have seen, I think the, the th one thing that potentially to watch is you know mortgage rates have gone up a bunch. Refi activity has basically dropped to zero. Home building activity has started to tick pretty substantially lower, at least for single family units. So you know, will that end up flowing through to the rest of the economy or will that be sort of a localized thing? I don't know. That's definitely something to watch more broadly. At what point will they be satisfied? They can sort of take their foot off of the, the brake pedal. You know, how much more things have to happen? I don't know. That's, that's sort of a, a tough question here. I think it's possible that the sort of soft landing scenario, I think the soft landing scenario is reasonable insofar as I think, as I've said, a lot of the causes of the excess inflation we've seen are due to these supply disruptions that are related to the pandemic and the war and, and, and things like that. And that in, 
I'm willing to believe that those disruptions and the impact of those disruptions should fade on their own given time. The question is, are we going to give them give the economy the time to, to have that happen? If we do, then I think soft landing is possible. If we're, you know, people lose patience, then not so much. And then like, you know, at that point, we probably would see something that looks like a recession. But and it definitely hasn't happened yet. Um, and that's like where things are getting tricky. I mean, you you mentioned I talked about something doesn't add up. GDP is most commonly looked at set of numbers for how the economy is doing. There's another set of numbers that conceptually should give you the exact same result called uh, gross domestic income, GDI, so production and income. They should be the same. What's interesting is that they haven't been the same over the past you know, year or so. It's, it's actually very weird how the gap between them has gone, has basically blown out. It's like a trillion dollars a year right now, almost, which is very unusual, biggest it's ever been. And, you know, Nobody has a really good explanation for why. I mean, I've written some things that people found interesting, sort of highlighting this as an issue and like what the explanations could be and how they're all sort of unsatisfying in various ways. But, you know, it's entirely possible. You know, people made a lot of hay about, oh, GDP fell in the first quarter. Maybe it did. It's also possible it didn't because GDI went up, um, you know, inflation adjusted. And so, again, like this quarter, it's very possible that, you know, GDP goes down again and then GDI doesn't. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but you know, the components of these things are moving in very different directions. It's just a very unusual situation for, you know, you're having so many workers getting added to the job market and so many people getting pay raises, so many small businesses, at least ostensibly reporting that they're doing well, that, and like corporate profits on the whole still holding up quite nicely. I mean, that's not a scenario that's consistent with recession. Usually some of those things are turning down. And so, you know, we'll see, you know, how things play out maybe things get revised. I don't know, but like right now, you know, I, I'd be, I'd be, I do not believe that we are in a recession now and I would be, but like, if we were to go into one, those are the kinds of things to be looking at, I think. Yeah. Those are good markers to be thinking about. The other, I think, piece that I'm interested in hearing your perspective on is yes, the Fed can raise in, in interest rates and they are. And um, that, that seems to be the, the foreseeable future for, for now, but they also have another, you know, I think, um, you know, tool in their tool belt and that's the quantitative tightening. Right. And so, um, can you just break down what QT actually is and how that might impact uh, the economy as well or financial markets as well? Because, um, you know, Richard Duncan, who's also an economist that I, I respect and read a, a lot of his work as well, um, talks about quantitative tightening quite a bit. And, and he was the one that introduced me to this concept and understanding um, kind of what it is and, and the impacts it can have. And as far as I know, I don't think we are in a period of quantitative tightening right now. Uh, I don't think we're in quantitative easing. I think you're just letting um, some of these treasuries roll off their balance sheet. But curious to get your perspective there, and is, if that's a if that's a tool or something that you've thought about um, that the Fed can use. And um, second part of this question would just be okay. So uh, in one of the, the newsletters you did write is is, is uh, labeled what the Fed should do, and let's talk about what they should do in your perspective as well, kind of in our current scenario. All right. Well, that's, there's a lot going on there. So I guess the first thing is that, you know, I think quantitative tightening actually is, depending on how you define what quantitative easing was, I think that is happening. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, the, the quantitative easing is a really weird term for, you know, interest rates at the short term, which, at the short end, which is what the Fed can directly control, hit zero or whatever they think is the effective lower bound. And then they say, we want to do more stuff. And so what they, the solution they've come up with in the past is we'll buy bonds. You buy treasury bonds, you buy, um, mortgage bonds that are backed by, you know, Fannie and Freddie and, and Ginny. Um, and, you know, more recently in the pandemic, they like were buy a few corporate bonds or whatever. That's, that was a very small program. So you have this big balance sheet. And then the question is, you know, what, what does that do? Well, one possibility is that lowers interest rates longer and longer in the curve. I think you know, one of the first pieces I wrote actually for the overshoot was looking at specifically what buying mortgage bonds did. And because of essentially, because you can prepay your mortgage without paying a penalty that, um, buying a mortgage bond exposes you to this weird kind of you know, prepayment risk. And so normally if you're the private sector and you target a certain amount of volatility or duration or whatever as, as a bond investor, you have to hedge that in various ways that makes interest rates higher for other things. If the Fed buys the mortgage bonds, they don't do that because they don't care. And so when the Fed buys mortgage bonds, it basically helps lower interest rate volatility and interest rates for everything else. Um, which is not the normal argument you hear from people like, oh, they buy mortgage bonds to help the housing market. And it's like, well, Buying treasury bonds helps the housing market too because it's just, housing is very interest sensitive. This is more specific channel. So like that was definitely a thing. And they said that they'd stop doing that. I think that will have an impact on rate vol. And like rate vol's gone up a lot. So I mean, I think we've Absolutely. seen that. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, so there's that side of it. And then there's sort of the, what does it do to the, you know, the liability side of the, of the Fed's 
balance sheet. And and so the one thing people look at a lot, and I don't know if it's the only important thing, but it's you know bank reserves. And bank reserves, you know, a long time ago people were like, oh well, you know, you do this money multiplier thing. Like that that's not how it works really. But that having been said, there does seem to be some relationship between you know if reserves are too low relative to whatever the bank system needs for whatever reason it is, you know, in the aggregate, like some banks may have a lot of reserves, some banks have fewer or whatever. If there's not enough, like you get these weird tightening of financial conditions. And like this happened back in September, 2019, when the Fed, you know, started doing repos and they started buying treasury bills and like, so this is like a thing. And so arguably by creating so many more reserves, they helped ease some of those constraints. Now, what's interesting is if you look basically since the start of this year, the amount of bank reserves in the system has fallen by about a trillion dollars. Now, the Fed's balance sheet has been flat, but that's basically because other things have been taking it up. So you've had more currency in circulation. That's not the main thing. Um, you've had a lot more deposits from the treasury at the Fed. So basically, when the when the government collects taxes and they don't spend it right away, they, they put it in their bank, and their bank is the Fed. So basically, you can think of that as taking deposits from the commercial bank system, moving it to the, the treasury. That's you know essentially a kind of tightening, right? Because it's not getting spent. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have a situation where and again, the Fed's been very open about encouraging this. People have been pulling money out of the banks to put them in a money market funds. And this is where it gets interesting of like what the impact of that is. Because you can sort of imagine two things. One is that it doesn't mean anything, right? Like I have money in one place, I have money in another place. Like I don't know, there's no more money. But if you think that um, taking deposits away from banks at the margin makes it more expensive for them to make loans or makes it, you know, and they pass that on in some way, then that's a kind of, tightening of financial conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's why, in fact, historically, the Fed has been cautious about having too much money flow from reserves to money funds. Now, I don't know if like that actually is, you know, explains what we've seen in the past few months. And in fact, you know, I I noted like, to be fair, like actually sort of core bank lending has been going up just fine, even as deposits have been moving out and, and as reserves have been transferred from banks to money funds. So, I don't know necessarily if that's the case, but you can imagine a situation where that process, you know, gets past a certain point and maybe it would do something. And, and you know, that relates to the thing you mentioned, um, like, you know, I, I was saying, well, what are the ways you could tighten the Fed, and, you know, how the Fed could tighten? And, and I was just sort of spitballing, quite frankly, but like one thing is like, because the Fed owns a bunch of bonds that are longer term and have fixed rates, and they pay for those effectively by having, you know, short term, inter- you know, liabilities that have played floating rates. It doesn't matter, strictly speaking, the Fed like loses money, but to the extent that when they make money, it goes to the treasury. And then when they don't make money, it doesn't go to the treasury. And then people in Congress can be annoyed. Like, you know, we have to pay your salaries now. Um, you can see why there'd be an incentive for them to, to not do something that raises the, the interest rates and their liabilities so much faster than their assets. And so one thing you could do is you could focus on doing asset sales first. doesn't seem to be what they're doing. They're not selling bonds to try to minimize that risk. The other thing you could do is be like, well, if there's a way, if it turns out that like you could shift a lot of liabilities from bank reserves to money funds, you know, without having to raise interest rates overall by that much, and that did tighten financial conditions, but I don't know if that's necessarily the best thing for the economy, but that would be sort of potentially a solution to the problem of, you know, how can the Fed do a lot of tightening in sort of the real economy without having to, you know, mess up its net interest income? It doesn't seem to be what they're going for. Um, I'm not even sure it's necessarily a good idea, but it was, you know, that was sort of an, op- an intriguing option I, I presented as like one way they could go about this if they were concerned about, you know, the net interest income forecast. Because right now, yeah, it like basically last year they they sent I think over a hundred billion dollars in profits to the treasury. The current forecast is like next year it's going to be probably closer to zero. Um, and zero could mean that they're actually making a loss; they're just not sending anything over. Um, so, you know, again, how much that matters? It's, I think it's mostly you know, political perception, but that might be something they'd be concerned about. The sort of ways potentially of, of managing that. Yeah, absolutely. Lots and lots to think about, and to, to actually really try to understand, um, you know, where where this might actually go, or what we might might. You know, I, I was looking in Ray Dalio's book. Is like, okay, so what what's the what's the fix? You know, what do you do? And um, I think his, you know, kind of um, idea is, you know, you raise productivity, right? And I think that's one thing that obviously is, is important to think about a lot. Um, And and we can do that and we can raise productivity. The other piece that him and and, uh, Howard Marks have been talking a lot about is, um, you know, the deglobalization and the onshoring of a lot of manufacturing and things like that. Um, does that raise productivity for the United States? Is that what Dalio is talking about? What is Dalio talking about when he says 
and we need to raise productivity. And how do you actually go do that? And is that the right fix? Or how do you come out of this thing? And what can we do? Well, raising productivity is always a good thing. So I'm not going to say we shouldn't do that. Um, but what if productivity is sort of a vague term. I mean, what it literally means is we can make more stuff that we want without using more inputs and more time. There are lots of ways to get there. Sure. If we knew how to do it, <laughs> you know, you know what would that right. mean? Right. I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's a slow, arduous process. I mean, it is the most reliable, sustainable way to get richer as a society. But obviously, like, there are things. I mean, you know, there's some things we, like, generally have a sense of, okay, like, you want to have a, you know, legal and political environment that's conducive to making long-term investments in the future. You want to have a good education system. You want to have, um, you know, abundant access to, you know, cheap natural resources. Like there are a bunch of things you want to want to live in peace, right? And like not being worried about the threat of violence. I mean, they're like, we know those things at one level, but actually, a putting into practice can be challenging, and b like quantifying what that's going to be or you know what you do differently from where we are now is also very tricky. Uh, so, you know, but like that, and it's also very slow moving, the rewards are not going to be kind of immediate. I think, you know, the question of reshoring or deglobalization is, is interesting one in this context, because a lot of people would say that that's actually going to harm productivity, because if you believe that the movement of production and the dispersal, dispersal of, you know, global production across the world reflects like factories being the places where they're most productive, which I'm not sure necessarily is true, by the way, but like, if you take that as given, then undoing that process is going to make everyone poor. Now, if that's not the case, or if reshoring means something a little different, not like we move stuff, but we sort of add stuff, uh, you know, which could be very different. I mean, like, you know, basically a, a positive sum vision of the world of, um, then maybe that would in, in increase, you know, productivity or at least make us richer. I think, the other tricky thing here, and this is very much relevant to the th one of the themes of, of the book that we wrote, Trade Wars or Class Wars, is that in general, we're living below our means. It might not seem like an obvious point now, given you know what's going on with inflation and stuff, but you know, at least pre-pandemic, it was very much the case that there's a lot of unused productive potential and a lot of unmet material needs. And this is just a very wasteful situation that we should be making more stuff and enjoying more stuff. And so the extent that we find ways to actually channel that so we do make more things and, and do enjoy more things, that in and of itself would make us richer and, and put us in sort of a better, higher growth path. Um, you know, how you do that is kind of tricky. I mean, you can, you know, some people would say industrial policy. I mean, maybe that's an element of it. You can look at, I mean, this is certainly being debated right now in Congress with things like, you know, CHIPS Act and so forth. And maybe that's, maybe that's right. I don't know. Maybe there's like a bunch of things you could look at, but I think that's, um, you know, how, I think that this kind of sort of broad-based view, like what increases productivity. Um, but I certainly wouldn't underrate, even though it's the hardest to quantify, like making sure, like, do you have the rule of law in your society? Do you have a nonviolent society? Uh, you know, they're like very basic, like are people educated and like learning like things that are really going to be valuable long-term, like not just, you know, particular facts, but very like kind of skills. And I mean, these are the kinds of things that are really important. I said, they're very hard to measure, but like, yeah. we know that like that's very important stuff. And so like, trying to making sure we don't lose those advantages that places like the United States have historically had, I think is also very important. Yeah, absolutely. Last predictions question. That's going to be a tough one. Matthew, when I have you on in, in six months and we're sitting here doing this again, talking about all these different components, financial markets, the economy, what, what does it look like? What, what are we experiencing? And um, I love Dr. Peter Lindemann, who's also economist Wharton school um, of real estate, but also uh, of Lindemann Associates, always has his canary. Um, what is the canary, um, or what, what's what's the outlook six months from now? Just give us your your crystal ball here, and definitely not holding you to anything, but just from the data that you're interpreting right now. Yeah, you know, I made jokes to people. It's much it's much easier, not easier, but uh, you know, it's hard enough to figure out like what has just happened, <laughs> much less what's going on now, much less what's going to happen in six months. So, Absolutely. you know, I I'll be be kind of cautious i think a lot of it i guess i put it this way like a lot of we i think we know like what are the kinds of things we should be watching that will affect the outlook so you know i think a big one is gonna be like what happens with the war with russia and ukraine i think that and how that flows through to commodity prices related to this in the sense that it's a big wild card we have no idea like what what's going on with china and covid zero policy i mean that's like a huge thing it's like when the chinese government shut down large swaths of the herb of its urban population and like literally welded people in the buildings you know, gasoline prices fell a lot because no one needs a car. Right. But you also have situations of factories getting shut down and like how that all plays out. I have no idea. I'm like, will it happen again? Right. I mean, that happened once. 
it's not clear by any means it's the last time not clear they've they definitely haven't gone back to fully open either so this is like these are two very substantial wild cards that we just don't i think have a, have a sense of um you know how that's going to play out you know i'm i'm tempted to say although you know i've been sort of wrong about this before but that you know some of the things that had been inflating a lot in price the momentum there some of them have already peaked mm-hmm. um and so I think we might get more relief on that front over time, you know, partly if you're just looking at the year over year changes, right? Like if it goes up a lot and then it flattens, it goes from, you know, steep inflation to, you know, not being contributing to inflation. So I think that you're going to element of that. That's going to get offset by the fact that other categories are probably going to see continued acceleration like rents, as I'm sure, you know, in, in, in your business. And so that's something to be wary of. Um, you know, I, I think those are some of the, some of the big questions to be looking at. I guess one thing interesting is, you know, will we find out, you know, with revisions or whatever, like, is business investment actually a lot higher than what the government had been reporting? This is one of the things that, like, I think is a plausible explanation for this gap between income and, and production. And, and you know, if that's the case, I mean, that'll change a lot of narratives. And also might, I mean, might make the Fed go harder, might make say like, oh, actually, productivity is not so bad. I don't know. Um, but that's like something that these are like the kinds of things I think we should be, should be watching out for. There's probably a zillion other things that, you know, six months from now, we're gonna say, oh, we should have thought of that. But, you know, <laughs> You know, I'm not, I can't, I don't see the future. I, I, I try to look at it and say, well, you know, what's just happened and kind of figure out from there. But I love what you said. You know, I mean, it's hard enough to understand what just happened and looking into the future is basically impossible. So, you know, I wrote this morning, um, one of my favorite quotes that Howard Marks always talks about is from, you know, Mark Twain, history, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And um, so just trying to understand that and uh, looking at the actual data uh, to make good, uh, educated hypotheses of what's going on. And so I think that's fantastic. You did a fantastic job of just diving into a lot of these different pieces. And, you know, selfishly, I asked you some questions about, you know, pieces of the, uh, that I get asked a lot that I wanted to, I wanted to kind of get your opinion on. So I appreciate that. I um, want to just end today's, you know, conversation around legacy and uh, why you do what you do, you know, what inspires you. And I mean, this is not an easy topic that you have undertaken. I mean, I can see all the books behind you. I can't imagine how much you have to read on a regular basis to stay in tune, but I just really am curious why you do what you do and what inspires you, Matthew. Well, that's a great question, Logan. I mean, and as I said at the beginning, I mean, really the financial crisis was sort of a defining experience and living through that and seeing how so many people who, you know, it wasn't their fault, right? They're just bystanders responding to the incentives that the markets were providing for them. And then they got completely hosed. And so, you know, not having that happen again and trying to, you know, I don't know if like, I don't expect that like I can educate every person or whatever, like even that I would know necessarily what's right for every person, but at least being able to elevate the conversation and try to add more useful, valuable information to, you know, whether it's for policymakers or investors or, or ordinary consumers so that, you know, hopefully we don't have that kind of thing again, because that was a total disaster. I think at the time it was a disaster. And I think the long lasting legacy of it was even worse in a lot of ways, what to do our society and, and for the world. And so that's really, you know, trying to make sure that we don't have something like that happen again is really, you know, the main driver. Yeah, that's a fantastic mission. All right, Matthew, where can people find more about you and what you do? So I write The Overshoot. Uh, you can find it at theovershoot.co. Uh, it is available, you know, you've searched for that, it should be pretty easy to find. And, and that's, uh, you know, what I write, I write about, you know, usually a couple times a week about the global economy and markets and uh, hope you can all check it out. It is phenomenal. Please go check out the overshoot. It is one thing I look forward to seeing in my inbox every single week and um, definitely uh, feel like I'm going to have you back on in six months and we're going to revisit this conversation and see how it went. So Matthew, thank you for your time and insights, man. I, I really know that our, our listeners are going to find this valuable and I surely did. Thank you very much, Logan. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to Invest for the Win. If you found this episode valuable, please take a moment to share it with a friend you think could benefit from the insights of our experts. Also, don't forget to take a moment to leave us a rating and review. Visit investforthewind.com to learn more.